Hello everyone, it's Miss Dolans, and today I am going to be starting a chapter book reading aloud to you, and the book that I chose is Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607 by Alyssa Carbone. This is a historical fiction book, so it is set in the past and has real information um, about things that happened in Jamestown, but it is a fictional story, so the characters and some of those events are made up. I'm going to go ahead and read you the back, which gives us a little preview of the book. 400 years ago, a boy fought to survive in Jamestown. Samuel Collier came from nothing, a street urchin, an orphan, and even a thief. He seems headed for a life in the alleys of London. So when he becomes the page of Captain John Smith and boards the Susan Constant bound for the New World, he can't believe his good fortune. He's heard that gold washes ashore with every tide. But beginning with the stormy journey and his contact with the native people, Samuel realizes that the New World is nothing like he imagined. The lush Virginia shore where they settle is both beautiful and forbidding, and it's hard to know who's friend or foe. The settlers' troubles are just beginning. The summer of 1607 brings mysterious illness and winter brings starvation. It's soon clear to Samuel that, he, that the ways of the English don't always work in this unfamiliar land. The settlers need to find new ways. As he learns the language of the Algonquian Indians and observes Captain Smith's wise diplomacy, Samuel begins to see that he can be whomever he wants to be in this new land. Let's get started. So it starts, there's a map. We are familiar with this map. We have the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Right here, Atlantic Ocean right here. This is the eastern shore of Virginia, which is a peninsula land surrounded by water on three sides. And then we have the rivers that we know. So this is the James River, but actually the native peoples called it the Powhatan River. And then here we have the Pamunkey River. And then here's the Rappahannock River up here. So we know that Jamestown is here on the James River. A lot of times historical fiction books will give you maps or different um, information about the time period. Chapter one. Now all of our books start with this transcript from a uh, book or a text or a letter or writing from the time period. So this is actually a primary source or a, 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 a excerpt, that's about the word I want, an excerpt, which is when they take some of the words and they cite it and they tell you about what actually happened in the time. So every chapter will start with this and then we'll dive into our story. So our first excerpt is um, from a prophecy delivered to Chief Powhatan, ruler of the Powhatan Empire, by his trusted priests sometime before the Christian year 1607. And it says, in the time of the first planting of corn, there will come a tribe from the Bay of the Chesapeake. This tribe will build their longhouses on the land of the Powhatan. They will hunt and fish and plant on the land of the Powhatan. Three times the Powhatan will rise up against this tribe. The first battle will end and the Powhatan will be victorious, but the tribe will grow strong again. The Powhatan will rise up. The second battle will end and the Powhatan will be victorious, but the tribe will grow strong once more. The third battle will be long and filled with bloodshed. By the end of this battle, the Powhatan kingdom will be no more. Hmm, what tribe do you think the prophecy is talking about? London, England, October 1606. So it tells our, our setting at the top. My feet slap bare and cold on the cobblestones. I'm breathing hard from the running. I turn the corner. The street is dark, empty. It's my chance. I find the right door under the sign with the three gold balls. I've carried a rock with me. I slam the rock down hard on the padlock, pounding until it breaks free. Inside the pawn shop, it is quiet and musty. It smells of old wood and candle wax. There is the locket displayed on a piece of beaver felt. I close my fingers around the cool, smooth silver. I haven't touched it since the day she died. Mine. It should have been mine because it was hers. I pull, but it is wired down tightly. I hear footsteps outside. I panic, yank on the wire too hard. The wire slices my hand, ouch. 
I see my blood drip, but the locket is in my grasp. You! Boy! A man lumbers into the shop. It's the shopkeeper come from his house across the street. He lunges, grabs me, but I'm too fast. I squirm away and run, escape out into the fog, and I'm lost, disappeared. I walk along the docks, past the dark hulks of ships, bobbing slowly. My heart is still racing. I try to calm myself. I listen to sailors laughing and arguing, their card games stretching into the night. I even venture a whistle. Nothing fancy, just my own tune. The shopkeeper will not find me, I promise myself. When he sees me in the daylight, he will not know it was I who wrenched out the, of the grasp in the dark shop. And he certainly would never guess that I have not stolen anything, only taken back what is mine. It should have been given to me when she died, this locket of my mother's. This will bring a pretty penny, they said at the poorhouse. It will pay for some of the extra food you eat. Can I help it if I'm always hungry? Then they expected me to stay on and keep working in the nailery, keep letting them beat me when they felt like it, as if I wanted to live in the poorhouse, as if Mum and I had wanted to be kicked out of our cottage on our farm, as if the blight was our fault and we wanted the crops to rot in the field and had planned all along not to pay the rent to the landlord of our cottage. But I chose the streets instead. I'd rather dig in the garbage heaps with the rats for my meals. Who knows, maybe my mom would still be alive if she hadn't been a widow and hadn't had to work so hard. First for the free greasy fat gentleman who owned our farm and cottage, and then after we'd been kicked off making nails for 12 hours a day to pay our way at the poorhouse. Maybe she would still be alive if she'd had an easier time of it. Not my father though. He would have drunk himself to death no matter what. I find my favorite hollow near the London Bridge. Spiked on a pole atop the bridge is the Excuse me. Spiked on a pole atop the bridge is the severed head of a traitor. A man who betrayed the crown of England and paid for it with his life. I turn my face away so I don't have to look at those dull staring eyes. I curl up and go to sleep. For this one night, the locket is around my neck, hidden under my shirt. One night. A sharp kick to the ribs wakes me up. This looks like the one done it. Scraggly hair, scrawny as a broomstick. I'm on my feet in a split second. Grab him! I try to twist free, but hands close on my arms, my neck. It's the shopkeeper and his burly son. I thrash and kick. They tighten their holds until it hurts. The shopkeeper pulls the locket out from under my shirt. Ah, what have we here, he says. A grin shows teeth brown as worms. It's mine, I cry. Mine! They don't listen. They talk between themselves as they tie my arms behind me with ropes. The magistrate will enjoy the delivery. Another criminal off the streets. The sooner he's hanged, the better. I throw my head back hard. It hits the sun square in the chin. Yow! He cries. He made me bite my tongue. He returns my blow. One swipe with his hand to the side of my head. Just like my father used to. And just like in the old days, I see black, feel my knees crumple, and I'm out before I hit the ground. All right, stay tuned for the chapter two.